Well, hello everyone. When we as Indians imagine ourselves a certain way, how the world looks at us, I think we think of ourselves as this raucous, can-do democracy. And some of us may be shocked to discover that while we are all of that, we are also the most depressed country in the world. I'm not sure how many of you actually knew that. Because when I discovered it, it was a real revelation to me. That 36% of us as Indians are or will be depressed at some point in our lives. Let me share another statistic before I introduce my guest this morning. 371 people at last count, 371 Indians kill themselves every day. That was approximately more than 1,34,000 people kill themselves every year in India. And yet, the irony is that we continue to see depression and mental health issues as some sort of self-indulgence, as some sort of problem of the rich and famous, as not really where the priority of science and medicine should be. Well, here we are in conversation with two people who are going to tell us why that needs to change, and that needs to change yesterday. First up, somebody who actually does not need an introduction. We know her from our cinema. She's one of our most celebrated actors. But she's somebody I admire for a different reason, in addition to her star power and her talent. She decided to go public with a deeply personal and intimate story on her own struggle with depression. In fact, in a one-hour nationally televised interview with me, and then wanted to follow it up with concrete action, so actually created a foundation to help others who grapple with the same issues. And we also have here Dr. Morley Durai Swami, one of the foremost neuroscientists and doctors from the United States of America, who spent a long time researching the science of the why, what, and how of depression and mental health issues. Deepika, once again, I must compliment you on your courage, because it does take courage, and it takes courage for somebody like you, even more than all of us in this room, to talk about our struggles, because you're, a, you're in the public gaze. There are a hundred things that will be said, that have been said, including really low-level things like, oh, she's probably just doing this to promote her next film, right? And I know, because I was in that conversation with you when you broke your silence on this on television, how difficult it was for you, how painful, how raw when you talk about it. And therefore, I'm going to say sorry, because I am going to, in a sense, put you through that moment again, because there are people in this room who may not be familiar with your own story. So let me start by asking you, when did you know that you were depressed? When did you start calling it depressed? And why did you, this fantastical woman on our screens, decide to go public with something so personal? Um, I think it started with just a feeling. Um, you know, it, just, it started with just a feeling of not... Um, of not being completely there, of feeling like, um, you know, like we, we spoke about that pittish feeling mm. in your stomach where, you know, and just breaking down for no reason. Um, and truly just feeling completely lost and not understanding what was happening to me. And I think it was the intervention of my mother um, who was visiting me at that time. And I think I, I, I lived with it for a while, actually. I was, I was filming a movie at that time, and I had no idea what, what I was going through. And I'd go to work every day. I'd literally have to pull myself out of bed and, and go to work. And my mother just happened to visit me, completely different context. And the day she was leaving, I remember breaking down. And um, I was extremely surprised, actually, today when I think back at how aware she was hmm. of what I was going through. And the first thing she did was to call um, a family friend, and Anna Chandy was a counselor. Um, but today, when I think back, and of course, I was hesitant at that point because I, wa I wasn't aware of what I was going through. I, um, and at the same time, for me, Anna is someone who's also a family friend. So I think that's where I, 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 I sought hmm. comfort. Hmm. But at the same time, I don't know if I would have done the same thing if I didn't have, um, you know, sort of that comfort level. But it was my mother who really sort of identified the symptoms and immediately called her up 
and in one phone conversation with Anna, she sort of understood what I was going through. But at the same time, I think it's the way she dealt with me and with the situation at that point. She didn't raise any alarms. Um, she made me feel like it was completely normal and okay and that we will get through this. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, with her and Dr. Sham Bhatt, who, you know, have worked on me, um, you know, so I, I think initially I was also reluctant to take medication. Mm. Um, but I think at one point I was just extremely exhausted. Uh, I couldn't do it anymore. And I, and I think that's when I decided to sort of, I said, okay, you know, let me, let me, let me start medication. Let me, let me accept this help that people are willing to give me. Um, and, you know, today there's a lot more awareness. Um, I don't, I don't think I can say that I'm completely over it, but um, it's always a fear at the back of my mind that I might always have a relapse because it's been such a bad experience for me. What was the most, I mean, I remember you telling me that you felt that pit in your stomach, you felt empty, you felt directionless, yeah. that you would lock yourself in your vanity van and sometimes just cry and you did not know why you were crying. That sometimes it helped to have people around, but sometimes it was the exact opposite. You know, that sense of being closed in by a crowd when you're feeling isolated within yourself. Yeah. It helped having people I was close to and familiar with. It was comforting to have them around because then... I could break down if I felt like, and if I had questions or thoughts in my head, I wouldn't hesitate to ask. But at the same time, if I was in front of the media or at an event, uh, which happened many, many times, um, that's when I'd feel a bit uh, suffocated mm -hmm. because I didn't want to break down in public. And this is before I made up my mind to go public with, with uh, what I was dealing with. Today, if that happens to me, if I ever go back to that space, and I, I hope I don't, um, I don't think I'd think t twice about e exposing the way I feel. And I think a large part of one's road to recovery is to accept what you're going through um, and to not challenge it, but to embrace it. And um, to actually allow your body and your mind to go through that experience and know that there is there is a road ahead that mm. will get you out of all of this. And it's not an individual, um, I, I don't think I could have done it on my own. I think it's very important to have that support system. So while you know people credit me uh, for coming out and speaking out, I think it's equally important for caregivers to, to acknowledge and for us to acknowledge that it's important for them to be with us on this journey. Now, before I get Dr. Durai Swami in, I want you to talk a little bit about the continued uh, the continued stigma, the continued stigma associated with mental health issues, with depression in particular. Uh, even today, if I were to be honest uh, in terms of eliciting responses here, even in this room with very educated, very aware people, in drawing rooms you will hear loose and idle chatter saying, oh, why is Deepika depressed? She has everything. She has money. She has she's fame. She has talent. She is going places. She's, you know, it's, it's, depression is treated as an indulgence. Like, you know, only people who have no real problems are depressed. So when you came out in that conversation and millions of people saw it online, on television, read about it, were you worried that the people were going to be horribly mean? And were some people horribly mean? No. I don't think anyone was mean, but um, I didn't even think about it. I didn't think about the repercussions. I think the You didn't idea, have a moment of how will this impact my public image? No, not at all. I think for me, the idea really was to just change the way people in India and in the world look at mental illness and, you know, give it the respect that it needs, um, you know. I think the idea really was to just change the conversation because I had experienced like literally a pre and post. And I lived with it for a couple of months without sharing it with anyone. And then today I feel so much lighter and so much better when I've, when I've come out and I've spoken about my journey. And um, I know a lot of other people who do. Um, there's not a single day where I've probably not met someone who has come up to me and said, thank you for sharing the story. 
but what's also helped them is the fact that they've then shared their story with someone saying i know what the pika's been through because i'm going through the exact same thing and they instantly feel a lot lighter what was the toughest thing about that phase of your life <laughs> was it feeling like nobody's going to understand was it the sense of losing control was it the sense of you know surrendering almost like you almost have to surrender to it before you can get better you can't fight it a lot of people think it's mind over matter but actually depression is matter of a kind and i'm going to talk to the doc about it in a second but what was the toughest thing about that phase of your life the phase itself the phase itself um i think before the intervention i think before i understood before my mother saw it before anyone else saw it to have to wake up every morning to drag myself to work to put on this face like everything's okay when deep down inside i had no reason why i was where i was and what i was doing and um life just says, it felt like there was no purpose i didn't feel like it it made absolutely no sense just life made no sense um so for me i think that was the that was the toughest part and mudi that can be staggeringly lonely what you know the thing about depression is is this kind of chicken and egg thing right you're already feeling like shit inside you're feeling what they pick up calls that pit in your stomach and then you feel like if you share it she was i think in a way lucky because she had this really supportive family she had this broader support structure in terms of a family friend who was a trained counselor yeah. sham bhat a wonderful doctor but most people are embarrassed about being depressed most of us are just plain embarrassed because we think we'll be judged that's right even though 36% of this country according to the world health organization is depressed yeah, yeah. so it's very well said and first of all uh, i commend you on coming out i think it's a transforming moment in india in terms of uh, mental health and the attitudes and we need more champions uh, like you and i can't yes. imagine a better champion than you so thank you um I want to um point a few things about statistics that you alluded to um you know depression mm -hmm. and mental disorders are now the leading cause of disability in the world and they are soon going to become the number 2 cause of death in the next 10 years or so in india something like 150 million people have mental disorders and especially amongst youth uh, the average age of depression in india is 30 uh, women are twice as likely to have it as men yeah. and amongst youth which is sort of defined as people under the age of 25 i think in the previous session karan said that roughly half of india's population is under the age of mm -hmm. 25 and our country depends on them for all of the accomplishments it's going to make there is one suicide every hour in that age bracket uh making india maybe one of the leading suicide countries yeah, it in is that the highest age, number of suicides bracket between 18 and 29 and all of the symptoms uh that uh, deepika described are classic symptoms of depression there is an enormous treatment gap it takes on average between 1 to 2 years for the average person with mental illness to even be sort of recognize that they have the symptoms to seek help and we have something like a 10 to 30 fold shortage of mental health professionals in this country so even if somebody recognizes that they need help it's very hard for someone living in the rural areas or someone who's poor coming from sort of uh, the marginalized sections of society to find the right uh, care and treatment can you so speak to exactly on that can yeah. you speak to why then depression is treated not treated as seriously uh as another illness which is more physically identifiable maybe like one of the things that deepika mentioned was that she resisted medication now that is a very very you know common response i mean I, i i remember i used to get anxiety attacks and when my doctor told me you know you need to go on medication i said no i don't want medications you know messing with my brain now this is a standard response and i was having this response as an educated aware journalist right so what intrigues me about the battle against depression is we are not able to cross that collective psychological barrier where even everybody sitting around me the first instinct is this happens to other people hey why would i be depressed this happens to other people yeah so i think tipper gore um al gore's wife suffered from depression and she described mm -hmm. depression as the greatest stigma of the 21st century mm -hmm. there's two elements of that stigma the stigma of depression is unlike the stigma of any other physical illness one is there's a self stigma yeah you yourself feel bad and you think it's a weakness 
And that sort of almost spreads to others around you, your family and your friends, and they don't want to talk about it. And they kind of hide the problem until they get burnt out themselves. And then you sort of you're forced to seek help. So it's a twofold, and, and depression affects the core of who we are as human beings, you know, our emotions, or just our personality, our cognition, all of that, and that, I think, explains why uh, the stigma has been so great. Uh, and I think things like what the Deepika's Foundation is doing, education, is really the core of yeah. overcoming stigma, especially education at younger age groups. And I think PM Modi, uh, in one of his radio addresses, said, mm. very simple, expression rather than suppression. Uh, and I think Deepika, exactly, she has done uh, that. By talking about it, by spreading the word, by educating people, especially in the youth, that's the key, I think, to overcoming I stigma. want to come to the science of it in a moment, but I want you to talk a little bit about uh, two things. One, I remember you telling me that at that phase when you slipped into this depression without knowing necessarily that it was depression, you had lost a very close friend. Mm. And... I remember you told me that, you know, again, you thought or you didn't know that this friend was depressed. And that if this friend could do this to him, you know, in, in terms of not thinking his life was worth living, just imagine how many other people around you might be living with that. So can you speak a little bit to how losing that friend maybe, in a sense, began your own journey of self-discovery of what you were going through. I'm not saying that was the cause of your depression. Yeah. I'm saying it probably helped you to uncover it. Um, well, he was a friend of a friend. And for me, someone I had met socially many, many times. Um, but I think, I think that was when I decided to sort of um, speak up and to do something about it because I, I was seeing so many people around me. Now that, that's just one instance. We wake up today, we read the papers, every single day there's a headline. And my heart aches because it's preventable. It's absolutely preventable. And I think a large part of also the stigma comes from the fact that in schools, we talk about physical education. We have physical education classes. I had physical education mm. in my school. But we didn't have anything to talk about mental health. Uh, not one session, not a class, not a, it's not part of the curriculum. So I think if we included that in the curriculum and we introduce just the idea of, of the importance of mental health, at a school level, there will be no stigma because it's the same way as a child, you're, you're creating, you're, you're educating me about so many other things. So educate me about the importance of mental health the same way we talk about the importance of physical health. Um, but yes, I think it was, it was that one experience, but it was many, many other, of course my own experience. And then to see someone who I'd known for so many years, um, and like I said, you see it all around you. And, and I've been there, you know. So it, it hurts to know that maybe in a matter of moments or maybe um, some sort of intervention by friends or a family member or, you know, maybe that moment could have passed and maybe things would have been very different today. And we're actually talking about saving lives here. We're not talking about something self-indulgent. We're talking about... Suicide. We're talking about people who feel, and, uh, and you know, this happened to your friend or friend of a friend, but you yourself had reached that perilous point where you were like, I don't want to get out of bed and go through my day. This life doesn't make sense to me. And that is an isolating, and actually it's a very dangerous, I want to underline how dangerous that sentiment is. It is. I think... Um it's so important, having been there, I think it's so important to identify that moment in your life and to not fight it. It's so important to just accept, embrace, talk to somebody about it. Um, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't mind if it's wrong diagnosis. I don't mind if I feel like I'm depressed, but I actually go to a doctor and he feels, or a specialist feels I'm not depressed. I'd rather be in that space than underestimate what I'm going through. Um, you know, when we have a fever, we don't think twice about, I'm not talking about medication necessarily, but when we have a fever, when we have a cold, when we, 
we don't hesitate to pick up the phone and talk to someone or casually mention to someone that I'm feeling feverish today, my throat is aching today. So why don't we talk about how my, how my mind is feeling? Why don't I'm not, I'm not feeling well today. You know, I'm physically fine, but my mind's not there. Why can't, we, why can't we talk about it the same way? So why did you resist the medication? And the reason I'm pushing you on this is because I know uh, Dr. Durai Swami will bear me out on this. This is the most common. Even people who are able to bring themselves to a doctor and say, help me. There is a resistance. The mind, we treat our mind as something, we ourselves treat our mind as something different. Yeah. Like if, if, if somebody tells us we're diabetic and we need Genovia or insulin, we will take it. And we'll say we'll also exercise and we'll lose weight and we'll do all of that, but we'll take the medicine. But when it comes to mental health, we resist. Why did you resist medication at first? I think it's the same stigma that we're talking right. about. It's the exactly. same stigma uh, that what if I'm already not feeling great and what if this thing messes with my mind even more? It's the same, it, it, it was just the stigma, nothing else. And the day I overcame that, I'm fine. So, how do we know if we're depressed? Great question. <laughs> um, so, I'm not just sad. No, it's a great question. So I think what most people don't realize is that clinical depression is not just your everyday blues or everyday passing sadness. You know, we all encounter moments of sort of blues, uh, rejections in our work, uh, family life, uh, accomplishments, playing tennis, you lose to somebody, yeah, we are all sad. But most of those kinds of everyday blues, we're able to snap out of it in a few yeah. days, in a few hours. Clinical depression is far more serious, far more debilitating. Typically, we, we define clinical depression in medical terms as someone having five or more symptoms of depression for most of the day, for at least two weeks, and these symptoms are impairing your everyday functioning, both at work and in your family life. So Google recently um, put out a screening questionnaire on their uh, search tool called the PHQ-9. It's a validated depression mm -hmm. screening tool. It's not a diagnostic test, so you cannot diagnose yourself with depression. Uh, and hundreds of thousands of people have already taken the screening tool. It's not available in India yet. Um, all it tells you is if you score low, then your mood symptoms are probably just benign everyday blues adjustment to mm -hmm. life stressors. If you're scoring on the high end, it's time, as Deepika pointed out, to go seek pro professional help. It may be depression, it may not be depression. A variety of medical conditions can also mimic depression. Thyroid imbalances, vitamin deficiencies in the elderly, small strokes, medication side effects. One reason why people don't want to take drugs is many older antidepressants carry a lot of baggage with them. Mm. Uh, in fact, a new study just came out that antidepressants double your risk for death on their own. So, so that's the sort of... So uh, then what do we do? Well, so medication is not the solution necessarily for depression. So milder forms of depression can be treated with therapy, can be treated with yoga, exercise, lifestyle changes, environment changes, family support, reducing isolation. There's a variety of things that one can do. But you know, you mentioned Google. And yep. one of the things I want to talk about is the double-edged sword that technology is. Sure. So we live in this most interconnected yet lonelier world than ever before. And we've all heard of this disaster, you know, sort of things like the Blue Whale Challenge that are actually leading young people into this sort of sense of isolation and, 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 and suicide and death. And the dangers of being alone in a crowd, the dangers of having a relationship only with your phone. Are these things to worry about more today than before? Is it true to say that we're in more danger of being depressed in today's world than we were 30 years ago? Or is it that 30 years ago we simply didn't know what depression was? Uh, I, didn't read, I don't recall what the newspapers said 30 years ago, but they probably said things like uh, the Sony Walkman would cause depression. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. I, I, I have no idea. But yes, it's true that... So we actually did a very interesting study. We monitored internet usage amongst a group of freshmen for a whole semester. And just based on their patterns of internet use, we could predict who were depressed and who was not really? depressed. For example? As, uh, for example, people who just spend enormous amount of time just on certain types of video games. Uh, you can tell by the color of the Instagram photos whether someone is depressed or not depressed. Explain that. Uh, just people uh, who have depression or who are going to get depression three to four months from now tend to post darker, more muted colors on Instagram. They don't tend to use the brighter colors. A study just came out like about a week ago. Uh, it's not yet, of course, these are not diagnostic tests, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is we have a two-way relationship with technology. Anyone who just spends over 
too much time with the internet. That's everyone and, here. Well, <laughs> not we just... We are all depressed by that. No. That screening test, we're all failing. No, no. That's causing sleep problems, which is going to lead <laughs> to <laughs> cognitive <laughs> impairment and dementia late in life. Yeah. So let's not worry about that. That'll yeah. be another session. Um, so kids really who are isolated, they're locking themselves up in the room, they're spending an enormous amount of time with video games, uh, those kinds of things. Yes, one needs to consider whether this is worrisome or not. You Parents need to really look at what kinds of games they're playing, if they're violent games, if they're all leading to the blue whale kind of thing, mm -hmm. then sure, there's risk taking. Teenage brains are not fully developed. So that's where I think one needs to be worried. On the other hand, I think technology can have a positive role because one, um, you can increase the access to counseling and I'm sure your foundation is going to use technology for education. Eventually we're going to have apps. There's a company in India called Wisa that's developed a chatbot to treat depression and they've done a pilot trial with it and it actually helps people. So as I mentioned, we don't have enough counselors. So we can use technology in a positive way to educate children, maybe create gaming, maybe create empathy by having virtual reality experiences mm. where they can understand what it feels like to be depressed. So the new movie Blade Runner is going mm. to come out. Uh, I, I may be t revealing a plot line. One of the women in the movie actually uses a gadget and says, I'm so happy, I want to see for once what it's like to be depressed. And she's able to like put a few pulses through her brain and spend six hours in a state of depression to see what depression feels like. And why is this a good thing to well, have no, this I'm just saying, exist? I, I'm not saying, what I'm saying is if you can cultivate empathy, one of the ways of cultivating empathy is to understand what the other person is going to go through. If there is a way for you to understand better what the other person is going through, then sure, that reduces the stigma. Deepika, uh, when you first started taking treatment, and I don't, uh, and I'm saying even before the medication, um, did you find it really difficult to not outsmart your therapist? <laughs> <laughs> because what a lot of uh, us who think of ourselves as reasonably intelligent, we say we know ourselves. We know ourselves, and you know what are you going to tell me, some stranger sitting on a couch that I don't already know about myself? Talk a little bit about that process. I mean, how difficult is it to walk into this room and start bearing your soul to another person who, even if in your case was a family friend, there are still barriers. And the thing about taking help for depression, it's a little bit like when we get a surgery, we don't care if our doctor sees us nude because we have to take our clothes off and get that anesthesia and get that treatment. So this is like bearing your soul. It is bearing your soul to somebody and it's tough. So talk a little bit about that process of getting help and the obstacles you had to jump over within yourself. I think for me, there was the stigma before. Not once you started. Yeah, but once I, once I made up my mind, once I decided that, you know, I'm, like I'm done, I can't, I can't live like this anymore and you know, I want to get better, I need to get better. And then it was a deep dive. Mm -hmm. There's no halfway. I don't know if there is, but f it wasn't for me. So the day I decided to then seek help and speak about it and, you know, speak to my parents, speak to my sister, speak to my doctors, then I'd share everything with them. So there was no... Um, no barriers, no holding back? No, no. Every question that they asked, everything they wanted to know past, present, whatever they wanted to know. Um, I shared everything with them. But that's unusual because a lot of people, even if they're able to cross the first hurdle, I don't know if you can bear me out on this, the second step is tough, right? So you, you say, okay, I'm depressed. I'm enlightened enough to know that this is a problem. I need help. But do I really want one person to know everything Intimate, when I say intimate, I mean things in my head that I may not have shared even with my parents or my sister. But I now need to share with this doctor to get help. No, I think it's a very important point. Deepika, of course, was working with people you already knew and trusted and highly qualified uh, individuals. So part of what you're talking about is called the therapeutic alliance. Hmm. And it's the job of a skilled counselor or a psychiatrist to establish that alliance. And you have to get a read on the person. So, you know, there's a saying in medicine, you don't treat the disease, you treat the person who has the mm -hmm. disease. You want to know, is this person open-minded to a biological view of depression? Is this person open-minded to more a psychological view? What are the triggering factors? What are the positive strengths? What are the weaknesses? You want to boost the positive strengths of the person to make them feel comfortable. 
uh, before you can introduce sort of the core therapeutic, uh, psychotherapeutic elements. So there's a process. It may take mm -hmm. a little longer for some people, uh, as you pointed out, but eventually they'll open up. That's why psychotherapy is not a quick fix like one day or two days. It may take several sessions over 12 weeks, uh, and then sometimes people have to get periodic therapeutic uh, counseling sessions for uh, months or years. Mm -hmm. Deepika, one of the things we didn't speak about <laughs> is, you know, why did you decide to go public, the foundation I'll come to, but you you didn't confine to sharing your story to your 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 mother and father and your therapist. You actually took it out to the country, to the world, and that could not have been easy. And I remember one of the things you said was that if I can change even one life, this was worth it. Yeah. But you must have wrestled with that choice at some point. Do I keep it within the home? Do I take it public? And I bring it back to the fact that you live in the public gaze, which makes your going public with it a different narrative than from, you know, if she went public with it. So what made you say, not just am I going to get better, I'm going to tell this story to everybody who cares to listen to it. I think it was at multiple levels, Barkha. I think one, like I said, after having been through what I did, if I could share my story, and if anyone in the world heard me, and identified with what I went through and could come out of it or understand and, you know, if I could make a difference to at least one life, I felt at that point I'd, you know, all of, you know, going public, speaking about it would be justified. Um, I also felt like the narrative around mental health in India needed to change. Um, and I... I can do that today, the very reason why we're sitting here today. Um, because I felt like when I hadn't, and like I said, I was also working at that point. Mm -hmm. I was like, why, why, why can I not tell someone when someone asks me, how am I doing? Like the, the, the film that you just saw before we came in is... I think what got to me was when people were asking me, how are, you, how are you doing? And one day I thought, are they really asking me how I'm doing? Do they actually have the time to listen if I said I'm not feeling okay? Will they actually give me that moment and understand what I'm going through? Or is it just perfunctory? Is it just superficial? Yeah. When we ask people, how are you doing? Is it just superficial? Is it just, you know, formality? Because that's the way we've been brought up. Like, just mm. ask and... Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, great. Everything's mm -hmm. great. Is re everything really okay? And I wasn't okay. So I think that's what really got to me because I wasn't okay. And it reached a stage where I was like, why can't I just tell people that I'm not okay? Mm -hmm. It was just that. Um, and, you know, and that's when I reached out and that's when I felt like I needed to talk about it. I felt like, because I felt bottled, I felt caged, I felt like, I felt like I needed to fly or swim or just not be boxed and, and to feel free. And I feel so free today. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. It is, uh, you, you underplay, uh, I think, the courage that you have shown. You have shown extraordinary courage. I've said that to you a million times. I will say it a million times more. Why the foundation? Because I felt like just talking about it, um, I want to help people. I want them to understand what they are going through. We want to create awareness. We want to tell people that it's, a, it's okay to feel the way you do if you're feeling a certain way. It's absolutely all right. Um, so to create the awareness, to reduce the stigma, which is going to take us many, many years, um, having said that, I think in just the last two years, I feel like the conversation is really shifted. shifted. Um, is it going to happen soon? Maybe not. But have we, are we moving in the right direction? Most definitely. Um, so to create the awareness, to reduce the stigma, um, to go into schools and colleges and educate teachers, educate students, educate parents that there is something like this that exists it's there, it's happening, it's happening all around us. 
and do something about it before it's too late. Um, suicide, depression is the next big epidemic to hit the world, if it isn't already. Yeah. And reach out to corporates, reach out to the corporate world, tell them that it's so important in your workplace to identify what you're going through mm. because the pressures are so high, to identify the people that you work with, um, you know, to help them if you see sort of any symptoms. Um, I think basically just to create the awareness and hopefully one day, you know, we also want to be the happiest country in the mm -hmm. world. We don't want to be the most depressed. We don't want to be the country with the highest suicide rate in the world. So workplace, I mean, yeah. we are at the India Economic Summit at the World Economic Forum. It is a question for workplaces. We are entitled to medical leave, but I don't know that workplaces offer medical leave for depression. No. Yeah, this, this discrimination is part of the stigma again. You, you'd uh, call it discrimination? I think so. There's no other word, I mean, that I can use for it. Uh, look, at the end of the day, there's no economic wellness without mental wellness. That's the core of any economic summit is that we're in a cognitive era. It's not the building of a company that has real value, it's the cognitive skills of their employers. And ultimately, you can't perform if you're not well. So uh, any company that's sort of short-sighted and doesn't offer leave or you know, for mental health or doesn't offer insurance for mental health, I think it's shooting itself in the foot. Yeah. So the World Economic Forum has actually developed a toolkit for businesses focused on depression. They've actually done pilot studies at a number of companies around the world. So if anybody here is interested, uh, you know, any corporates here in the audience are interested, that would be a useful resource. What would you well. advise people in charge at workspaces? What is the foundation, Deepika, for example, in courage? What do, you, what do you say to an employer? Let's say there's an employer in this room and she or he want to know, my uh, colleague comes to me and she says, I'm depressed. Right. What should be my professional yet empathetic response at the workspace? So to the individual, or are you talking about at a corporate As policy As a policy, level? but I'm just taking an individual example. But what would you advise on policy? Well, as policy level, first of all, I think public-private partnerships are going to be very key. So they could partner with a foundation. There are plenty of foundations. There's Banyan, there's a Spark, there's a Deepika's Foundation. I think education is going to be very important. Uh, setting in policies that are anti-discriminatory against people with mental illnesses, encouraging employees to volunteer, because volunteering itself builds resilience against future mental illnesses, making available resources for people to get care and accurate diagnosis and treatment, giving appropriate vacation, and making sure when they come back from the treatment of their illness that their career trajectory is not shifted and de derailed. So, 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 so let me just be the cynic here and say that when you talk about public-private partnership, is one thing for foundations sure. like, uh, like Deepika's and others to join hands with the private sector. But when you talk about people who don't have resources, who don't have money, the like poor. Like small businesses? You mean? No, okay. the okay. Uh, rural India rural or poor India. people. If you take a trip to the All India Medical Institute, you have people waiting out in line whose children are dying of cancer and they cannot get time with the oncologist because the public so, health system is so strained. I'll make a comment. Can we convince the government of India to actually turn the public health system towards depression given the social stigmas, given the overstretched nature, given the absence of resources? Yes. yes. Uh, and the pick I will also comment, but I'll give you three examples. In the U.S. about 10 years mm -hmm. ago, um, the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Communication, uh, introduced a new Lifeline Act, which made sure that smartphones were available to every poor person in the U.S to call. The city of Birmingham in London created a public-private partnership with about 20 companies, raised $125 million, started a 24-7 hotline for college students and high school students to call in on mental health issues. They also started a special college where people who have mental health and drop out of colleges can catch up with their curriculum and go back to the original college. New York City has started a $30 million public-private partnership to take care of mental health amongst the homeless and amongst the poor. So yes, it's entirely possible. There are hundreds of corporates here who would be glad to support such an endeavor, but uh, maybe you want to add to that. No, I think um, similarly, I think it's important for people at workplaces, uh, policymakers to sort of like we were talking about leave, yeah. you know, if, if I'm diabetic, if I have a surgery, if I'm pregnant, um, if I'm X, Y, and Z, you will be allowed medical leave. Whereas if you have, if you go to your boss and say, I have depression, 
he's more likely to say i'm going to have to sack you yeah um we need to normalize that we need to treat it like any anything else um i think a large part of the stigma or a large part of even if there's people who want to come out and seek help um you need to confide in your boss so you need to confide um i think there's the fear of losing your job look at your own life if you had gone to a film producer and said i can't do this film right now or because i'm depressed what do you think would have the the, the response would have been maybe there are people who haven't offered me films because they think i'm depressed and i can't act i don't know <laughs> you maybe think, you think that's I happened doubt it. maybe i don't know it has and did that make you no, ever regret I'm, going I'm, public i'm in a i'm in a good space because i can choose the movies no i know i want to do I know. but i don't think everyone has you know has that luxury of choosing yeah. where they want to work when they want to work so it's important for the organizations to understand that we need to treat this the same way as as anything else i think it's equally important to have uh, frequent sessions in in your corporate offices about the importance of mental health i think it's important to to have a tie up with a counselor or maybe have an in-house counselor or or a, yeah maybe not a psychiatrist but it's it's important to have an in-house counselor when when you know your staff is burnt out they need to talk they want to speak to someone somebody's there or at least make them aware that they should and i feel today it's important to just seek help of a counselor anyway because our lives are so fast paced with technology with so much going on in the world i don't think there's any harm in just seeing a counselor anyway because did you continue to uh, see a counselor even after you got better um yeah on and off on and off Whenever but i know you needed i to. know a lot of my friends who who've never experienced anxiety or depression but it's very important for them to see a counselor to see their counselor every now and then a lot of people do and we need to normalize that as well um a lot of people say i have a meeting <laughs> you lie about it um i'm in the middle of something i'll call you back <laughs> you know um or you know just lie and say i went to a general practitioner yeah. you know we we need to normalize it we it has to be as normal as anything else so i'm going to open this up i don't know how we're doing on time actually if somebody can tell me but just uh, minutes, we've got 10 minutes you know the cultural dimension doctor uh, because this therapist thing reminded me that you know a friend of mine recently said to somebody who said i've got a meeting with my nutritionist at 1 and my counselor at 2 that you're really living the american life now this is <laughs> right but there is a cultural dimension yes. to it like in india we think of these things incorrectly as these western imports into right. our country so i want you to speak briefly on that and actually i'm seeing um, Anna Chandy right. here who's actually Deepika's counselor so i want to bring okay. her into the conversation sure. but just on that thing of the cultural dimension culture is very important and yeah. all treatment and diagnosis has to be culture appropriate um there are many many psychiatric disorders that uh would be viewed as abnormal in one culture that are normal in another culture i'll give you an example yeah. uh, which is somewhat uh, uh not pertinent here but there's a condition called william syndrome mm -hmm. where uh people are born with this genetic condition they don't discriminate at all they treat individuals of all races as equal of course uh in countries where uh you know there is a lot of racial discrimination that would be seen as a good thing in america for example people see people with william syndrome as something very great in other countries where there's sharp class distinctions people see william syndrome kids as like very so apply that to depression very, yeah so depression has to be treated in a cultural context yeah uh you cannot treat depression outside of the culture you have to diagnose it but sometimes it. you have to push the boundaries of what is culture appropriate as well sure. right it was not part of uh, indian urban culture even 20 years ago to go and see a therapist right but today there is a greater acceptance so culture is not static either sure but that's not to say that american or western psychotherapy is the only solution you know there is a variety of indian and hybrid techniques that are very important if someone believes in the bhagavad gita you know people may not realize bhagavad gita was the original psychotherapy session the crisis psychotherapy session right so yoga meditation all of those are very powerful i think it's a misconception that you have to go with the western psychotherapy yeah. uh we've done studies others have done studies that yoga is just as effective 
Uh, and there's a variety of other techniques as well. It's an entire lifestyle change, if Correct. I may say. Um, my life, literally pre and post, um, my life post depression is very, very different from my life before. What's the biggest one, biggest difference? I take care of myself. And I don't feel guilty about but it. But didn't you always, like as an actor, take care of yourself? Or do you mean beyond physically taking care of yourself? It's absolutely not in Related terms of physical to... appearance. But it's important to... Um, and especially with women in India, I feel that there's a lot of guilt yeah. attached with taking care of yourself and doing things for yourself because we're constantly playing roles and constantly doing things for other people. And the minute you take that one hour off because you want to go and see your friends for lunch, you're, yeah. there's suddenly so much guilt. Mm. It's totally okay to do something for yourself, a little bit of some, you know, of, of me time, whether it's going to a get, getting frequent massages, whether it's sleeping, uh, you know, adequate sleep, um, eating well, just taking care of yourself in 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 a holistic. Uh, in a you know in, in a holistic way not just medication like we talk about is just one of the things that and that's that's the approach I took yeah you know maybe and, and it'll be different for we want to emphasize that we're no one's dissing medication medication can be life-saving for some individuals yeah so I want to make sure yes. that uh, you know it doesn't work for everyone okay I need to go into the audience we have five <laughs> seven minutes Anna why don't we start with you if you just want to speak, uh, start taking Deepika's experience with you as a starting point, but what you'd like to say to the people here, especially parents, I think for parents, for families, you know, what should they be looking out for? I think um, in India, particularly with the experience of the foundation, uh, adolescent children, a lot of the symptoms, uh, obvious symptoms show up in depression, early stages of depression as behavioral. And therefore, parents and uh, teachers need to have awareness and education that uh, some of the behavioral symptoms, if, again, as uh, Dr. Dore Swami said, if they are clustered with other symptoms and they are existing over two to three weeks, then we need to look deeper into it. For example, uh, it was with deep sorrow that last year, a young boy in Bangalore was expelled from an international school all that he complained was headaches. So he, uh, he was 17 years old. He would put his head on the desk. And they expelled him saying misbehavior. Mm. So Dr. Button, myself, actually called the school after the diagnosis and said he's got depression. And so they ca can you take him back? And they said, we don't want to deal with mental health issues. Today, the young boy has joined University of Chicago uh, for his undergraduate program. So the discrimination and excluding young yeah. children, uh, you know, yeah. under the guise of laziness, because sometimes there is apathy, laziness or labeling them, I think. Uh, or not wanting to take the responsibility. Like I can imagine the school calculating, oh, if this boy does something to himself, we don't want that responsibility. Absolutely. No one wants to take that responsibility. Yeah. We've had a lot of pushback from schools as well. Yeah. When we've wanted to, you know, take our schools program. Um, a lot of schools, I have to say, you know, we're very, very open uh, to the idea. And in fact, we've covered, I think, more than 300 schools in the last one year. But it's, it, and it's surprising that a lot of schools Resist don't encourage, it. yes. That they it'll change. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the other thing, which I'd like to, cont um, in continuation with what you said, I think India is a context and we look, we're a collective society. So even when we look at mental health issues, I think we need to look at it from a collective thought. For example, for me as a practitioner, uh, in my private practice, I insist on a systemic view of the issue because the individual is suffering. They can't manage this on their own. So the system or the collective, the family need to be part of that process. So what I do is the individual becomes to me the voice of what's happening and the other members also come in for therapy because they also have their own issues. And I think this is very, very important in India. Uh, while I'm not disputing that, um, you know, Western approaches uh, are important, but we also need to remember a lot of the Western approaches are individualistic. Hmm. I see that huge sure. difference in Excellent. terms of context. We do a, one more question, which you need to understand. In the rural area, there are mental health workers that include the soothsayers, the witchcraft people, the astrologers, as part of the education program. 
And one of the programs that we run in, a North, in North Karnataka, we have actually funding a prog program in the rural area where the local people become part of the counseling process. Yeah, you have to get the quacks out of the system as well while being open to alternative modes. Uh, question there, yes. Yeah. Hi, I don't know if I missed, I came in a bit late. Um, Ms. Padukone, you had everything going for you. You're good looking, you were, you were rich, everything. So tell me... Um, don't say, why are you depressed? We, no, we, no, I'm asking... <laughs> I, then, then our one-hour conversation has been... <laughs> Let her, tell back. Me, <laughs> can now. depression come to anybody for no reason? Because um, somebody who has everything going for her, why should she get depressed? I'm asking this not from a personal point of view, because I know of some uh, people or somebody that uh, is going through depression, and I'm not able to figure out What's the reason? Right, so I I'm think asking Dr. You, Murley would um, be the right person to answer that question. But can I just preface here, because you, you did come in late, ma'am, and one of the things we did discuss was that this is the response that actually hems people in. Right. That you've got everything. Why are you depressed? Well, yeah. nobody wants to be depressed, right? So it's not like you're wishing it on yourself to be depressed. So we don't fully understand the biological roots, but there are biological triggers. Could be partly genetic, partly a mix of some psychological, social, and biochemical factors. If there was a way that I could have scanned you know, her brain at the time that you were feeling empty, sad, maybe we would have seen some changes in biochemical circuits, etc. But at this point in time, we don't fully understand it at that level of cellular uh, circuitry alteration. All we know is that there's a combination. Some people, it's an obvious response to triggers. So, for example, you, know, you just tell someone, I don't love you, and you spiral into a downward spiral of depression. That's an external trigger. Yeah. In others, it just comes out of nothing. They're doing fine, Seemingly and all nothing. of a sudden, yeah. it Seemingly just comes nothing. in there. Okay. Seemingly nothing. Um, I'm going to take a, yeah, here in the front row. Are, are we out of time? Okay. Hmm. Just last, last comment, yeah. So, in option B, uh, Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant talk about two phrases. I know exactly how you feel, and let me know if I can do something for you. Mm -hmm. When you hear these two phrases, do you feel comforted, or do you feel a cognitive overload? Because research do shows... Do you feel comforted that you've been understood, or do you feel that you have to tell other people how they can help you? <laughs> it's a bit of a confusing question, yeah. yeah. Do I feel comforted when somebody asks me? So, in the book, they'd say that uh, one shouldn't actually say, I know exactly how you feel. Oh, okay, ah. okay, 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 all right, because got it, got it, got that's it. That's true. So, do you like, do you, do you feel people got you with empathy or do you feel like they're patronizing you? Like, they don't exactly know. I can tell the difference. I can, <laughs> I can look into their eyes and know. You can tell. You can tell when someone's genuinely reaching out because they know, um, either they understand they're empathetic and they know genuinely what I've probably gone through or they, or they know someone who's been through the similar experience. Um, and then there are the ones who are just faking it. All right, I'm afraid we do have to close it there. I'm getting the signal that we do have to wrap. Uh, I think it is fair to say that Deepika's public accounting or chronicling of her own story uh, is not just brave, but it has a purpose to it. Let's just say that the foundation, the telling of the story is a purpose, that the next time somebody says to you that they are depressed, please treat them with the respect that that sentiment that that ailment, it is an ailment, and it is treatable to some degree, preventable to some degree, like any other physical ailment, and that would perhaps be the biggest service we can do to people like Deepika and Dr. Dharai Swami who work in this area. Let's have a round of applause for our guest today. Thank you very much. And to you for brilliant moderation. Thank you. <laughs>